So on behalf of the committee to study memorials, I want to thank you for attending this dedication ceremony. Um, we are honored to have some members of the Lee and Snyder family in the audience today. I'd also like to thank um, our elected and town officials for being present, Selectman Richard DeSorger, Town Administrator Mike Sullivan is here. I also would like to thank the members of the Beckwith Post 110 for, for supporting us in this thing. Um, Troop 89 has been gracious enough to help hand out um, programs in our honor guard today. Um, and we are lucky to have um, Thrills and Chills, an acapella group, who will perform the national anthem. And now Troop 89 is going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now we'll have Richard DeSorger for the dedication and unveiling of the Earl Winifred Lee honor sign. Thank you. Good morning. Earl Winfred Lee was born January the 18th, 1922. He grew up on Park Street here in the small town of Medfield. His parents were Winfred and Bernice Catre Lee. He attended elementary school at the old Ralph Wheelock School on Pleasant Street. During the warm days of summer, he loved to walk with his brothers and sister along the tracks to go swimming in Kingsbury's Pond or play and hike through the open fields and vast woods of Medfield. Earl graduated from the Hitter Adams Bath School on the corner of North and Dale Street with his 23 classmates as a member of the Medfield High School class of 1939. Following the graduation ceremony, Earl and his classmates went to New York City as part of the annual class trip where they visited the 1939 World's Fair. Athletics had been on the rise during Earl's years at Medfield High School. During his senior year, the boys' basketball team won eight of its 12 games. The baseball team finished at 500, finishing fourth in the then Tri-County League. And in the six-man football league, Medfield High finished six and two. Suddenly, on Sunday, December 7, 1941, Earl and his generation's lives 
we're all changed. The carefree and bright future of millions of youth were put on hold, and a generation of Americans went off to defend their country. After the outbreak of the war, Earl enlisted into the U.S. Army Air Force on October the 15th, 1942. Tech Sergeant Earl W. Lee was a flight engineer, top current gunner in the 446 Bombardment Group, 707th Bombardment Squadron. He flew with the crew aboard a B-24 named Sadsack, based out of England. On February the 4th, 1944, his plane was out of commission, and they were forced to fly instead a B-24 called Black Widow. Their mission was to make a bombing run over Frankfurt, Germany. After crossing the coast from England into German-occupied France, the Black Widow fell out of formation. The intercom had failed. The engine was smoking. Instead of turning back, they spotted a German V-1 missile launching site near Abbeville, France. After dropping their load of bombs, the Black Widow was hit by heavy gunfire from attacking German ME-109 fighters. Earl's plane caught on fire, crashed and exploded near bray sous somme France, the site of the World War I battlefield. Of the 10 crew members, five, including Earl, were killed. The other five survived and were taken prisoners of war. Earl was machine gunned while parachuting out of the plane. The five killed were buried first in a local cemetery, grave marked, mass of five unknown. After the war, on April the 6th, 1948, the grave of the five was located by Frank Adams, the father of one of the other soldiers on the plane. Earl and the other four crew members were returned to the United States and interned together in the Jefferson Barracks National Cemetery in St. Louis, Missouri, on September the 9th, 1949. That Missouri location was chosen because it was in the exact center of the United States. Frank Adams closed the Missouri ceremony by saying, the boys will now be together until the end of time. Now, if you think about it, if Earl were here today, he'd be 92 years old. He'd probably be here with his children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Officially, a town street named Earl Road in 1970, this road is now, today, March the 24th, 2014, officially dedicated in honor of Earl Winfred Lee. And I'd like to ask members of the Lee family to come up and unveil the Lee Memorial. I'd like to ask Ron Griffin to come up for the dedication and unveiling of the George Thomas Snyder Honor Sign. Good morning. Thank you for coming. <laughs> it is my honor today to present a brief overview of George Thomas Snyder. Some would say he was one of the quietest, most peaceful, polite, and happy young man you could ever imagine knowing. Being so easygoing and likable, however, does not provide immunity to the dangers and risks of war. George Thomas Snyder was born in the county of Upshur, West Virginia. Upshur consists of one city, Buckhannon, and about 70 unincorporated towns. Upshur County is the home of over 20 coal mining companies and they employed most of the local inhabitants. Coal mining was not a very safe occupation and many of its workers died early due to occupational hazards or from one of the many occupational health factors. 
So it was with his father, Milton, who died on May 1946 at the young age of 52. Now George was the youngest of six children. He was born to Milton and Gladys Snyder and was just 17 when his father passed away. He was of the age to join his fellow classmates to work in the mines, but others thought differently about George's future and wanted him to avoid the pitfalls of life in the mines. George's older sister, Aretha, had married a local man named James Floyd Hours, and they had already left West Virginia and were living here in Harding, Massachusetts. Now, Harding is a section of Medfield along Harding Street and in the area of the Medfield State Hospital. Having no family income and little employment opportunities, George and his mother moved here to Harding and became part of the Hours family. Floyd and Reether already had two children, four-year-old Glenn and an infant baby girl, Gladys Reether, who became better known as Sissy. Floyd would eventually establish Floyd and Glenn's auto service on Adams Street. Had things turned out differently, it might well have been named Floyd, George, and Glenn's auto and truck repair. With his amusing southern backwards accent, George quickly became friends with the area, other area Hardy Boys, several of which are here today. He quickly found nearby employment in the Atlantic Brick Company on West Street. Now, working in a brick company factory is neither easy nor clean, but it was still a huge improvement over working in the, the mines. Here, George and his, had family, he had friends, he had employment, he had a nice car. He enjoyed playing softball and socializing with his new friends and could often be observed cruising the streets of Medfield on his motorcycle. Life was good for George, and he lived believing no one and no thing could bother or upset him. Meanwhile, President Harry Truman was facing some diffi very difficult choices. The, county, the country was already engaged in a Cold War with Russia, and that was exhausting our current military resources. Then Russia, the Russian supported North Korea forces invaded U.S. supported South Korea. Fearing the advancement of communism into all of Asia, President Truman faced the difficult decision to defend South Korea. Congress passed the Universal Military Training and Service Act in 1951 to meet the demands of a likely war in Korea. One and a half million unmarried men aged 18 and a half to 29 were called to serve their country, and George was one of them. On May 11, 1951, George left his quiet, peaceful life in Harding in exchange for a grueling life in the Army. After basic training in Chaffee, Arkansas, he was off to Oklahoma, after which he sailed on to Japan as part of the 279th Infantry Regiment of the famous 45th Infantry Division. There he participated in intensive training with several other div divisions in preparation to defend Korea in the, on the 38th parallel. On December 28th, the, re the regiment arrived in Incheon, Korea. In late June, hostile activities escalated over the Battle of Old Baldy otherwise known by the military as Hill Number 266, or by the mil movie industry as Pork Chop Hill. <clears throat> it was during this battle on June 27 that George's journey of life came to a sudden halt. At the age of 23, his life is over and his dreams for the future come to an end. There will never be a Mrs. George Snyder nor will there be children to call him dad. His name will never hang over an auto repair shop in Medfield, but instead will become a name of one of its streets. The Korean War is often called the Forgotten War or the Unknown War. Because of lack of public attention, 
it received both during and after the war in relation to the global scale of World War II, which preceded it and the subsequent Vietnam War, which succeeded it, yet almost 34,000 Americans lost their lives in this forgotten war. 34,000 is a lot of Americans, much more than live in all of Upshur County and Medfield combined today. If you look in the Medfield phone book today, there are no Snyders. If you look in the Korean War Memorial, there are 76. <coughs> today, we take a small step to ensure one of those Snyders and Medfield's lone fatality of the Korean War is never forgotten. I would like to ask the grandnieces of George Snyder to come up and unveil the plaque with the great grandniece, too. So now I'm going to um, recite a poem called The Last Soldier. When the last soldier passes on, when armies are disbanded and militias discharged, when weapons are abandoned and armor discarded, your mission will, at last, be over. For you know the soldier's secret. Yours was not a mission of war, nor a mission of ruin. Yours was not a mission of destruction, nor a mission of death. Your mission was safety, security, protection. Your mission was honor, loyalty, service. Your mission was to end violence, tyranny, despair. When the last soldier passes on, when the uniforms are retired and the final grave filled, we will remember all who served and sacrificed for our nation. Until then, God of old, Watch over our soldiers and our veterans. Renew their courage, rebuild their strength, heal their wounds. Bind their hearts with your steadfast love. Remember them, bless them, sustain them, and give them peace. So on behalf of the Committee to Study Memorials, we wanted to thank everybody for attending. Um, over the next few months, the signs will be replaced um, on all the other previously dedicated streets to look like this. So if you have a chance, take a time to kind of stop and read them. Um, you know, it's wonderful to have the histories documented for generations to come of the sacrifices made and um, their stories, you know, so that they can be remembered in moving on. Thank you very much.
Hi, I'm Mike Sullivan and you're watching Medfield.tv.